my first topic. Here's my second topic, third, fourth, you know, just identify that across the course of your year. All right. That's the first thing I would do. Then what I would do is I would say, I'm going to build a progression of knowledge, a proficiency scale for each one of these topics. So you've got your simple, your target. So by the end of this topic, by the time I finish teaching that topic, here's what kids will be able to do. And here's my complex. So you build a scale for each one of these. You might have six of these. I don't know how many you have, which would result in six proficiency scales. Then what I would do is I would go to my state standards. I would, I would go to the standards last and I would say, all right, as I teach this first topic, I hit this state standard and I hit this state standard, okay? But instead of having standards-based proficiency scales, you have topic-based, and within each of those topics, you're addressing some of the state standards. Does that make sense? Would that be considered tagging? What do you mean tagging? Tagging is where <clears throat> we define it in your book as you already have the assessment, so you, you, you've created the assessment before you looked at the standards. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Then you mark standards uh -huh. that it follows. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You're just but going the, about it differently than starting with the standard. Uh -huh. But in a content area where the standards are vague and evasive and really, really comprehensive, in other words, the standard on presentational you could, print, you could teach holidays, you could teach greetings, you could teach, there's all kinds of things that you could teach that fit within presentational. It just, it gets really, really clunky. Whereas if you just say, I'm breaking my school year down into these topics for instruction, and as I teach these topics, I hit this standard and this standard and this standard. Here's what typically happens as a result of that. You find you hit each of the standards lots of times, right? But through the different topics that you teach. Tell me how that resonates with you all. Just talk to that for a moment. Can I read a <coughs> from the New Art Sciences of Classroom Assessment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it talks about tagging. It says... Even though sampling, I see, with tagging, the teacher designs assessments and then looks for standards that appear to be related. Even though sampling has an intuitive logic to it, it doesn't work well with classroom assessments. No. Indeed, sampling was designed for large scale assessments, but even there, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, so what they're saying there is. Um, you would be on any assessment <coughs> addressing multiple standards is what it's saying. So it, it kind of mirrors a high stakes assessment. I think it works well in a content area such as yours. Let me show you an example. Is it going to be on your screen? It will. Okay. This is not, a, I'll, I'll get to some um, world language examples here in a second, but let me just show you what this group did. So what we've been trying to do, because our understanding is that we should have a standards-based curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so we've been trying to create units that are titled what the standards are. Mm -hmm. And you can find resources that back that up, and you can find that some that deviate from that. Mm -hmm. And because our standards are so open, they basically you know, they they have standards that say student will be able to express their needs. Yeah. Okay, so what what do we actually teach there? Yeah. You know, I could because it's as very it's as full of variation and variety as any particular student's need sure. might be, which everyone in this classroom has different needs. Yeah. So we've taken it to mean that instead of teaching specific content all the time we need to be teaching more of a skills-based um, 
learning where they get the language skill to express a need in whatever context they may find themselves in. I got it. Well, I think that's certainly one way you could go about it. I mean, social studies could argue the same thing. They could say, well, our new standards are super skill-based. In other words, yeah. they're, they're, they're tracking chronology over time, all the time, and they could do that with anything they teach. So mm -hmm. the skill we're working at is, you know, how did what happened in 1850 how did that over time impact where we're at right now in society? They could do that with all kinds of things. So that's certainly one approach that you could take. But here's what I believe. I believe you're already teaching the content of your standards. Yes? Well, yeah, but we're, we're constantly yeah. trying to yeah, we'll go, hone that. You know what I mean? We want way. to... It's so much simpler. To do what? To just focus on the standards. Unwrap, unwrap the standards. Focus on the skills. What was on the, you know, what was, what's in the can-do statements? Because uh -huh. uh -huh. you know, it says here, it says, um, it says it con this is also from the New Art and Science Classroom Assessment. Mm -hmm. It says, it constitutes a record-keeping convention that wastes teachers' time and renders the standards inconsequential. Inconsequential. Uh -huh. In fact, we believe this approach is actually the antithesis of using standards meaningfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's just simpler. It's less time consuming. <coughs> it's easier just to unwrap a, a can-do statement and write an assessment than to go through, unwrap it, go through all this tr book and <laughs> when it's a very simple thing like express needs, you know. Express needs would be like, okay, you need to know the verb to need. Okay, I, I get it and that makes sense to me. So then what you would do is you would identify in your standards by your course those high priority yeah. statements of intended knowledge gain right and then you would build out your units of instruction right to teach the content of those particular standards yeah. the challenging thing is going to be i think with that do you teach students will be able to express needs in isolation. Is that a two-week window of time where you work on that? Or is it something that could spiral around time and time again? That's, that's our plan, is to explicitly teach it uh -huh. and then spiral it through several units. Because uh -huh. you, you can use that in almost any time, any situation. Totally, I mean, totally when you're agree. In, you're in Tijuana, you need a two-setter basis. Uh -huh. How are you going to do that? Uh -huh. But we want to give kids the freedom, you know, with the knowledge application tasks, uh -huh. which one of them is student-generated assessments, uh -huh. and it says that's one of the most powerful. Oh, it is. It is. And so yes. what we want to do is, is get them in using these skills in something that's important to them. Mm -hmm. We feel that that would be a longer term, that they would remember it for longer. Mm -hmm. Like I had kids that, you know, they wouldn't, they didn't want to engage. And then I said, well, what would you do in a situation that's important to you? And some of them it might be, oh, I'm going to have a, I want to have a auto parts store. Or I want to do this. I want to, and when they put it into something that was a context that was important to them, the engagement just oh, it does, went doesn't like crazy. It? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting, though, is the real disagreement that they have is between foreign language teachers here in the middle schools, is, and it really is a philosophy issue, right? Because what the high school teachers want to do is they want to teach specifically the skill set, but they don't have any book or anything, right. any guidance or right. any of that kind of stuff. The middle schools want to use a book as guidance and teach the standards within, so that, in essence... Is, is that kind of fair to say? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, the division of where we are, um, and it's been pretty heated and uh -huh. everything. And so, so, so can I add, just from a curricular standpoint? Yes. Yeah. We need to do both. We need to have a touchstone that is a resource that we can come back to and, and use, but you're also looking at how do, how do you incorporate how does the resource support the, the content or the, the standards? 
because that's that's what we did in the elementaries that created such a disparity in terms of kids being able to read. We use Fontas and Pinnell. Very cool. Well, Fontas and Pinnell isn't a program. It's a series of, of what kids can and cannot do. Yes. <coughs> you can, so, I've got more. And so that's why having a specific resource that if a new teacher, it's great. You guys have all, how long have you been teaching foreign language, Brian? 10 years now. 10 years, Chad? Three, right? Fifteen. Fifteen. What about that first year teacher? One of you guys leaves. That first year teacher comes in. If they don't have a single resource that they can use as a touchstone that they see how everything is related back to, we have just put them completely underwater. And that's why when it comes to curriculum, it's it's a both and. Yes, you need to have a resource that, that everybody can use, and it's a touchstone, and it's a conversation piece that you can come back to. When there's a disagreement, you can come back to that. Because otherwise, all of your disagreements come back to what? Your individual philosophies. No. And trying to come up with your individual philosophies. That's where we are. That's it. Chad, that's where it's at. I've been dealing with it for four years. Okay, we have, we, we may need to talk about some stuff, because we want to push back. But we get raised voices, okay. and this, this is one of our norms. It is. It's one of our norms, what you just did. So what did I just do? You raised your voice. We, we feel threatened by that. Okay. Okay? Well, okay. What, what we're saying is we have literature, and we're getting, like her book says, faulty logic. Authority is the final Okay, we want to avoid that. We're trying to, we're using the literature, Marsano, Solution Tree, stuff. And we're just getting, this is the way it's going to be. So ultimately, there has we're confused. to be, ultimately there has to be a decision point. And that's what I was trying to communicate with you, is from a curriculum standpoint, all of our content areas need to have some form of resource that they go back to as their touchstone. And yeah, we feel like we're we feel like we're being forced to get a resource when really we're we we don't need it. We you just need the standards. You don't, but that first year teacher that comes in does, Chad. So it's not just. But about if they know the standards. The the whole idea is that the curriculum is bigger than any individual. It has to be. Otherwise, the curriculum is not a guarantee. It changes as people come in and out of a building. That's what, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And that's what, what, what we feel is the can-do statements. We feel we can take those, unwrap them. Would you be willing to train the next year teacher exactly with that and actually go through and mentor them as they go through their entire first year as they're doing that? That's the issue is... The touchstone, you know, the, if we, have we, a, we need yeah. to have something very decided, you know, so that that new teacher can actually feel like they're things. I've been a new teacher um, as a French teacher, and I had a curriculum resource. I moved away from the curriculum resources simply because, um, as I've looked through the textbooks, none of them do any of the things that we're trying to do with our standards. That's one of the problems. Is mm -hmm. there, if if the curriculum the resource, like you say. If the curriculum resource, the advantages of it are clear, um, but I say if, because so far, in all of the resources that we've looked at, all the resources that we are, they are very are they're very limiting mm -hmm. on what we would have to do. Like it says, you must teach this, then you must teach this, then you must teach this. Their scope and sequence is rigid. Their scope and sequence is defined and. And you can't get away from any of that scope and sequence. If they just provided, right. hey, so if you're teaching this verb, here's a whole bunch of things you could possibly do. You pick and choose which ones you're going to want. I think we would all be like, great, that's awesome. But so far, I mean, and I've done a lot of textbook resource looking at, and essentially they're, they're based in this idea of a ritually defined scope and sequence, um, which is not in alignment with some of the things that we're trying to do. 
um, so let me show teaching. you an example of both okay both of these approaches that I talked about here do you the, want to project up here maybe that would be easier yeah can I yes 